talk to us about the building, talk to us about the progress, and, and why is it so important for you to invest in this area? Ali, thanks so much. You know, there's no one that's more excited about our new headquarters than our team at Ryan. Uh, we made a decision several years ago to relocate our headquarters to Legacy West, uh, and we acquired a track there. The building had its topping out ceremony about two weeks ago, so we're really excited about being right in the middle of Plano in uh, August of 2024. Uh, it's an interesting story about how we made that decision because my first instinct was I wanted to be in Uptown. So we went and we looked at this great building that at the time John Goff was building, McKinney and Olive, and it was really an impressive building. And so when I left the building on the way back to the office, I told our real estate folks, uh, head of our real estate team, Robert Wirtz, I said, Robert, we're gonna move to Uptown. And he goes, no, we're not. And I'm like, excuse me? You see the name on the building, right? He said, Brent, all of our people are north of George W. Bush. And literally, we have about 90% of our team, which today at our headquarters comprises about 850 folks, north of uh, George Bush. So we made the decision that instead of some of our competitors who have made investments in uh, uptown and downtown Dallas, we made the decision to try to be as close to our team as we could be. So very, very the vast majority of our people are gonna have a 10 minute commute or less. And they're super excited about that. Now I'm kind of the odd man out. Uh, I'll have a little bit more of a commute than I have today, but that's okay. Uh, the reason we made that decision is one, we wanted to be close to our people. Uh, that particular location at Legacy West is like the epicenter of an incredible pool of talent that we pull from. It's also an epicenter of many, many of our major clients. But probably most important when you think about why North Texas, Ollie, is because there is probably not another place on this planet today that is a better location for a global headquarters. Uh, we have almost 5,000 folks working around the world in 60 countries, and there's no place better than DFW to be able to get to all of those locations to be able to do day trips to New York, even Seattle if you want to get aggressive about it. But the reality is the location is incredible. And obviously now with all the growth that's coming to North Texas and the booming Texas economy, frankly, you know, that's just an added plus. So there's just so many reasons why we made that decision. And today, you look back on it, it just seems kind of obvious. Yeah, it, uh, it certainly seems obvious. If you heard Brent talking early in the, in the answer there, he cares about his folks. Part of the reason Ryan's been so successful, the folks are the top priority. Uh, Tom, why don't you share a little bit about the, uh, the Cowboys investments in the region and then Jones family investments as well? I'd be glad to, thanks Ollie. So the Jones family owns approximately 3,500 acres of undeveloped land, primarily north of the bush, most of it in fact, north of 121. Um, and as you, heard, as you heard Brent say, North Texas, in particular, the north side of North Dallas, moved Plano into Frisco, where, of course, we're very, we're very, very partial to, to uh, Frisco, Prosper, Salina. That's where the bodies are coming. You know, when I moved to Dallas or in 1997, we had, Dal we had worked for KPMG. We had a Dallas office. We had a Fort Worth office, and nobody thought twice about that. It was two separate markets. It was two separate places. It's 45 minutes from downtown Dallas to Fort Worth. Maybe I drive a little fast, but we'll call it 45 minutes. Um, it's 45 minutes from downtown Dallas to Frisco. Um, and it's about 50 minutes from Frisco to Fort Worth. And so suddenly you, you look at that and you realize that triangle. And when you pick that third point on the triangle, you now take everything north of Frisco and bring it into play for your people. Um, you get to a point where you can start talking about residential all the way up to the lake. Um, I actually was on a panel earlier this week and someone asked us if we thought the lake would stop us. Uh, if, you know, if, if the lake would stop North Texas. And I said, well, I promise you it will stop North Texas because at that point it becomes South Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> but, but fundamentally, that's why we're there. It is because, as you heard Brent say, there is no better place to open a, glo a global headquarters. And then you couple that with the right municipal leaders, you know, the, the, the right partners. Uh, just, we've, been, we've been blessed to be in that area, um, and we're, we're pretty proud to keep doing it. Um, well, and you know, Ali, I forgot one of the most important things that attracted us here is the Dallas Cowboys, right? I mean, where else would you rather be? North of 121. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Uh, municipal leaders, Tom Walker, uh, sitting right next to me, Mayor Cheney. Mayor Cheney. Um, you've yeah. had, you've had a, a bit of success in Frisco. Talk to me about, uh, try to narrow it down, a couple of the super highlights. 
<laughs> well, we lost a big one in Ryan. Um, but it does give me some gratitude that his, uh, his office will have a view of Frisco. So every day he can think about what could have been. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> um, no, our, uh, our success story is really a simple formula. It's um, finding the best partners. Um, you don't find a better partner in the Dallas Cowboys. Um, you know, if you look at any city in Texas that is having success, you can find that same ingredient in that city, that the best developers are in their community, um, the best organizations, because winners want to be around winners, um, and then it just becomes self-fulfilling. Um, and, you know, we knew bringing the Dallas Cowboys to Frisco that there was going to be a halo effect created that at the time we couldn't even imagine, but we knew it would just come. Um, it's why we did a partnership with the PGA of America. We relocated them here to Frisco. We decided we wanted to be the modern home of golf. And if you haven't seen that facility, um, you know, you need to go, uh, you know, check that out. It's pretty incredible. And that's creating already a halo effect um, around that. And so in my position as a municipal leader, if you go to most cities and you listen to the people, they use the D word as a bad word, and that's developer. Right? Oh, d the big bad developer is going to come take over our town. Why are you giving incentives? Why are you giving money? Jerry Jones is already a billionaire. Why would you give him more money? All these types of things. And the successful cities don't look at it that way. They're like, we need to remove these barriers. We want um, the Ryans of the world, cons at least considering our city. And if they're not in our city, we want them in our region because, you know, if Plano is successful, we're successful, as Mayor Ross said. You know, we want the Dallas Cowboys of the world. We want the Hunt Real Estates of the world coming to our community. Um, and we've built that reputation in Frisco. And so um, I, won't, I won't mention the name, but there's a developer um, that everyone would know. It's a world-class name and literally approached us last month and said, we cannot believe we have not done a world-class project in Frisco. Can you find us a spot? We have to have our brand in your community. Um, and so winners want to be around winners, and sex, success brings success, and that's just been our simple formula. So you can't share it. There's no media in the room. No journalists <laughs> here at all. Um, Brent, Brent, I'm going to move to you. Uh, let's get a little more specific. What, what makes North Texas unique in terms of, is it, is it a stable regulatory environment? Is it cost of living? Is it variety of lifestyle options? What makes it so special? You know, I, I think it's all of those things. I think it's a unique mix of many great attributes. Certainly, you know, all across our great state, we enjoy um, what in today's world is a very reasonable regulatory climate. Um, you know, the ability to do business here, to build a team, to curate that team um, is, is, is exceptional. Um, if you've uh, ever dealt with personnel issues in the United Kingdom or uh, in the People's Republic of Canada, um, you would know that this is a really great place to do business. Uh, we have a stable tax structure. It's a very, very uh, attractive tax structure for individuals. And when you think about many of the people that are coming here, they are the leaders of great companies and great businesses that they've built that are literally uh, refugees from incredibly uh, high taxing jurisdictions. And these folks are not learning. You know, they were a high tax jurisdiction a decade ago. And now they're doing things like, who doesn't love the Los Angeles mansion tax of 5% on any property over 5 million? Who, who, who doesn't love the millionaire surcharges and the wealth tax that the uh, California Assembly uh, tried to enact. Um, if those proposals came to Austin, Texas, our legislative leaders would just laugh. Uh, and for that reason, this is a haven for refugees from many, many places that are just being taxed, you know, uh, completely uh, out of their businesses. Uh, you know, what they don't understand is that that's a vicious cycle down and it's really, really hard when Ken Griffin decides to move his multi-billionaire, uh, multi-billion dollar business out of Cook County, Chicago, it's never coming back. And the 150 million a year he was paying in tax is going with him. So for us, it's like a magnet for people that have been successful. And Mayor, when you talk about people that are successful, they want to be with success. 
Uh, and they especially want to be there when there's a big, big incentive for them to do so. The tax climate for our businesses is also pretty reasonable. You know, Texas is not the lowest tax state by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a reasonable tax state. You can, you can build a business here, you can grow a business here, uh, and you can keep, uh, you know, a really good percentage of what you create uh, when you do that. So I think those things are really, you know, key. You know, th there's, there's also other attributes, but those are, those are some of the most important ones and ones that, you know, it seems like our competition uh, you know, what used to be our competition, I'm not sure we really have that much competition anymore, maybe some in, uh, in Florida, but uh, a lot of those folks are just going in the wrong direction. And what's amazing to me, uh, you know, representing clients all across the country and, and across the world is many of them are doubling down on that strategy. So when you wonder why the, 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 the exodus to Texas is increasing, it's because many of our competitors are doubling down. You know, one other thing, Ali, I'll mention too, one of the most important attributes of uh, our Texas economy is our leadership. You know, you, you, you talk about um, Mayor Cheney, uh, Mayor Johnson. I mean, folks that are making good, solid decisions every day that create and protect the business climate that we have here. You know, I, I made a post on LinkedIn yesterday uh, in response to uh, Mayor Johnson's joining the Republican Party uh, and making the comment that, you know, many, many cities uh, across the United States need more Republicans. I happen to agree with him on that. And, and the point of my post was leadership matters. And if you look at public safety, I mean, that's very, very important. You know, I'd, I'd like to be able to, you know, go between my home and my business without being mugged. Um, doesn't work so well in D.C. Uh, if you have been reading the newspaper. So I think also that's another important thing. And when, you know, when mayors, you know, when, when mayors like uh, the ones that lead North Texas step up and say, hey, Defund the police, forget about it. That's ridiculous, not going to happen. Look at what's happened over the last couple of years uh, compared to crime rates. I mean, you know, North Texas is a safe place to live, and that's pretty important too. I would love to kind of jump in on that just real quick, and Brent kind of hit, knocked that out of the park and answered the question for us. But one thing that I want to add to it is his opening remarks, which what we've seen change and evolve over the years since I was a young council member in 2007. It used to be that if you could convince the CEO to want to live in your city, then you could win the business. And that was kind of the angle. And you kind of heard his comments. He, he's accepting a longer commute for the benefit of his employees. Now it's flipped on its head. And the HR director has a seat at the negotiating table. And it's all about quality of life. Are my employees going to want to live here? It's all about the education. You know, What kind of educational partners do you have in your community? How are you going to train my workforce? Um, what are the schools? All these kinds of things. And, you know, a great one of those success stories is actually Wiley X. Wiley X is in Star Business Park, um, a company that came from California. And their CEO on the groundbreaking day basically told the story of they wake up one morning and said, we want a better life for our employees. Let's go find the place for them. And that's what started their journey um, to Frisco, and they're happy to be there. Well, and Jeff, I'm going to jump in on that one because that's exactly where I was going to go. It was the Wiley X story. So they moved their headquarters and their production facility from the Bay Area in, in San Francisco to Frisco. They moved all of their workers, which mo normally, as you know, people don't do that with those type of transitions. And they literally lost like five and had people that were in tears thankful because they moved to Texas and had a chance to buy a house. They had a chance to send their kids to a school they felt comfortable with. He, he said they, they had no idea the impact on a positive way that it was going to have on that business when they moved people halfway across the country. And so that's the perfect example of why North Texas. So, so you mentioned it. We're getting specific here on, on, on things that make North Tra Texas attractive. Um, curious about workforce. One of you guys mentioned this. Let's talk about the pipeline uh, of talent, but also how do we work with our colleges and academics in the community? And I'll open it to the group. You know, I'll, I'll take that one. Obviously, you know, in our organization, we've been, we've been blessed to have a great partnership with UNT. Um, as, as well as several other universities we work with just to find talent because it is, I mean, as Jeff said, the HR director has a seat at the table. Companies follow their people. You have to get good people no matter how much you want to be in Chicago or New York. If you can't find people, you can't operate, right? And so we have to find those relationships and what you find in North Texas is the universities, the school leaders are, are reaching out to the businesses and the businesses are doing the same thing. 
we've got a handful, or I say handful, we've got several handfuls of high school students and college students at the Y Texas Summit. Those are the kind of things we've got to get our kids involved in so that they're ready, you know, they're rolling through this system, they're getting used to that, and you're going to hear from some people who are far better at talking about that than I am, but it's about building those relationships and having a very open dialogue and a constant relationship. You know, I run a 45-person finance department, and I've got a couple of professors that I will call, hey, I need a body. Can you find me somebody coming in the next two, three, five, six months? Yeah, we spent a lot of time studying the research triangle, um, really trying to kind of understand that ecosystem and how they built um, their, their business community there. And your university partnerships are critical if you want to be a city that is successful um, in bringing, you know, top tier organizations um, to your community. I mean, we had dreams many years to bring Fortune 500 companies um, to Frisco, and we saw some come to the region and so forth. And you know, here just within the last couple of years, we not only had our first with Keurig Dr. Pepper that moved into the star, um, but then had our second with TIAA, which is building their, um, their headquarters right now, um, you know, as well. And it was very much, we knew it was mission critical to have that university partner. And so UNT had a small presence um, in the office park in our community, um, and we went very aggressive after them and said, we need you in our community. And we went from having a first conversation to opening our first $100 million building in about a four year span. Um, and we look forward to them expanding their campus. And I've challenged them to one day have more students in Frisco than they do in Denton. So uh, they're, well, they're well on their way for, um, for that. But th that's how you create this ecosystem. These large companies, you know, they're not investing as much in R&D anymore, right? So their R&D departments are their acquisition departments. So they want to be in cities that also have innovation happening, that have IP being created at the campus level, um, you know, so that all that intellectual property kind of feeds the whole ecosystem. You have to attack it from kind of both ends of the spectrum. And that's a big part of why we've started to have a great deal of success in Frisco bringing these types of organizations. We now have five corporate innovation hubs in the city of Frisco. Um, and so we have given our economic de development team the kind of the moonshot, which they're well on their way to be, um, you know, the um, venture capitalist capital of the central part of the United States. And we, we think we can steal that from Austin, tr truthfully. Oh, wait, this is a Texas conference. So we want to um, co <laughs> <my next> collaborate <laughs> with uh, the city of Austin and be a great partner. Um, <laughs> um, but we couldn't do that without the university relationship. Well, Ali, I, I can tell you, uh, I'm a proud UNT alum, and uh, you know, our a, a big part of our entire um, you know community outreach is education. That's one of our main pillars, and certainly we've made uh, significant investments at UNT. Uh, I often wonder if that's really philanthropy or if it's just um, an investment, really, because of the pipeline and the number of students that we have to hire across North Texas. And I'll say this: workforce is important. Uh, an educated workforce is important. You have to have the numbers to meet the demand so that companies can grow. But there's something really unique, I think, about UNT grads and, and really people that study and go to school in Texas. Uh, and it's the thing that we have to have in our business. You know, in our business, we fight with governments all across the world every day. Uh, that's not an easy job. Uh, and we need folks that are smart, but we need folks with grit. And I think that's one thing UNT does. It produces folks that you know have you know not always had a silver spoon in their mouth when they showed up at the college campus uh, and they learn and they grow and they graduate and they are hard chargers they're, they they have grit and determination and that's what i think makes uh, one of the important drivers of our success in north texas so we're, we're going to take a question or two from the audience but first i just got to go to mayor cheney here i heard mayor ross out there talking about uh, you're not allowed to say the f word in arlington <laughs> So I'm curious to know, you, you compete with, with other economic developers across the country, across the globe. How competitive is it within the state? I see a, a couple of fellow economic developers in the audience. You know, I think it's interesting, and Frisco's this way as well, when we're starting to make a pitch for somebody, we start with the Texas story first. And all the things Brent mentioned, Brent mentioned about, you know, why Texas is a great place to relocate, a great place to do business. You know, then we talk about the region. DFW, what makes it unique and special, and then we hone in specifically on what's unique um, to Frisco. You know, everyone remembers um, the Amazon um, H2Q or HQ2 pitch, you know, kind of frothed the entire country. 
What was fascinating about that is it made every city kind of take a hard look at themselves. And the region took a hard look at ourselves. And kind of what we learned coming through that process, because we bid for that as a, um, as a region with the Dallas Regional Chamber, um, is that in DFW specifically, there's a lot of different flavors of ice cream. There's something for everyone. And every city has their unique value proposition um, that is really interesting, that is really fascinating. And so um, we've kind of learned that in all the mayors, you know, we get along very well in this region while we're, we joke and have a good time about competing and when someone wins a project over another. Um, but in the end, what we know is, as Mayor Ross said in his opening remarks, is that when, when we don't win, we want our neighbor to win we, because we know it's going to continue to help. When the star comes to the city of Frisco, that helps Plano. That set a mission, you know, kind of a path forward for Prosper and Salina, knowing that, okay, the growth is going to come here. Um, you see Salina, which is north of us, they're already making big bets on residential neighborhoods because they know all the employees that are coming, you know, to the city of Frisco. And so um, the region as a whole benefits. When one of us win, we all win. So it's, so it's very competitive, but collaborative. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Um, well, I'm going to bring up some additional panelists in a minute, but are there any questions from the audience? We probably have time for one or two. In, in the back. Hey, uh, good morning. My name is Scott Francis. I'm with uh, County Director of uh, Commercial. My question is for uh, Tom. You mentioned the Jones family has about 3.5 uh, hundred acres North Texas. I'm curious if all the activity that's going on, if y'all have a master plan uh, to develop it, and if so, that timeline has accelerated uh, in any shape. You know, the benefit of working for a family office is that we've got the luxury, we have the luxury of time. Um, and, and the flip side of that is we have the ability to make decisions relatively quickly. Uh, and so master plan is probably a stretch if you think of a traditional master plan where everything is laid out. If you want to talk about it as a, as a you know, a, a a goal, a general direction. Yeah, we know. We generally know where we're where we're going. We generally know what each parcel we think would be for. Um, but you know, you get surprised on occasion. The, the best story to that is the correct Dr. Pepper headquarters now sits at the Star, directly opposite our practice fields. Um, and if you have been there, you realize that building sits on what was our surface parking lot for our players. Um, and we still have players, by the way. Um, <laughs> Sunday night in San Francisco, we're going to prove that. Uh, so, but it it became. It became an opportunity and a great partnership and a great conversation with the, with the correct Dr. Pepper folks of, okay, tell me what you're after. Let's see if we can meet it. And maybe we can and maybe we can't, but it's very much about the dialogue. So we do have, like I said, we've got some general direction and we have some goals for each of those properties, but we've got the luxury of pivoting if we need to. Uh, I represent the, the state of Rotten and Falls, Germany, and the Director of Trade Office in, in Texas. And I was curious in terms of closing the talent gap bridging academia with industry, if there are any strategic plans to focus on dual apprenticeship programs that have the equivalent academic qualification for the U.S. as well as for, for Germany, considering that Germany is bringing a significant amount of foreign direct investment into the United States and very much looking at Texas. Proof of that was the fact that the foreign minister was in uh, Austin and Houston just uh, a week and a half ago. Yeah, that's a, gr that's a great question. Our um, economic development team um, spends a lot of time internationally. I mean, Texas very much has a global audience um, and global opportunities. Um, you know, that's going to be a great conversation probably for your next panelists, um, the university partners, you know, as far as how they'll help, you know, contribute, you know, to that. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the business world, the business climate is only going to become more international as we can continue to move forward, and, and the cities and regions that aren't thinking about that are going to be left behind. Folks, we're going we're gonna to bring up additional panelists here, and actually that question applies to the next group really, really well, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to bring up uh, Chancellor Lawnen, Chancellor Williams, and Charles Gassenheimer. Um, I'm going to kick out Tom and Mayor Cheney. Thank you guys very much. Really appreciate it. And Brent, I'm going to have you hang out. Stick around. So um, we're going we're gonna to sort of continue the conversation. The idea is uh, we talked a lot about why North Texas and why it's so attractive to industry. But we certainly wanted to connect the dots with, with colleges, with education, and make sure that we have a nice, significant talent pipeline. Uh, Chancellor Lon, and I'm going to start with you. Talk to us, share, share a little bit about your pipeline, but more importantly, how do you connect to industry? How do you connect to the corporate community? Yeah, Ollie, good to see you, and thanks for the questions. Great to uh, be here with everyone. So I, I serve as the Chancellor of Dallas College. Dallas College, we have 125,000 students, seven primary campuses across 
at Dallas County. And I talk a lot about really, we're in the barrier busting business. We're identifying those barriers to get in the way of student success to, through, and beyond our doors. Because for our students, um, we know what uh, gets in their way oftentimes are the life issues. So we're focusing heavily on removing some of those barriers, uh, be it transportation, be it adding child care centers, uh, um, embedding the cost of textbooks into our $79 uh, uh, tuition rate, uh, because we know those things get in the way. But we, community colleges, uh, I really view as the bridge to economic mobility and prosperity for individuals seeking to get into the educational pipeline and then business employers seeking to build that workforce pipeline. So we work very closely uh, with our employers to ensure that our programs can move as quickly as we need them to. Over 300 different programs, both short-term certificate programs, associate's degree, four-year degrees, that, um, that whatever the path, whatever the pipeline that the student's looking for, ultimately, they're looking to get into jobs. So, you know, when Toyota uh, decides they're going to consolidate their operations from California and Kentucky, come to Plano, uh, and uh, as, as Mr. Ryan was saying and others were talking about, the number of employees that will move with them, well, for, you know, um, every accountant that moves, you know, you need 10 accounting techs, and where are you going to get that? You're going to get that here locally uh, and build that workforce. Again, whether it's a student that's going to get a short-term certificate, go into the workforce, they're going to go to one of our transfer partners, um, which UNT is one of our largest transfer partners, and go on and continue their, their studies. But for us, uh, it is every single day engaging with employers uh, to ensure that we're meeting the demands of what they need to build a workforce. Chancellor Williams, you've got a, a proud UNC grad sitting next to you. Uh, talk to me about the same idea, the talent pipeline, and how do you connect to corporate industry. To industry. Um, and then I want you to touch a little bit about how technology is helping bridge that gap as well. So, Ali, for, you know, for us, uh, I think it's a time for, you know, across the, across the country, um, there's real questions in a lot of places about the value proposition of higher ed. Uh, people uh, and families are looking at, is the value I get uh, worth the price I'm having to pay. And so we have to address the value proposition question. And to me, that comes starts with the, the being willing, as, as Chancellor Lyman said, to being willing to look at ourselves and, and partner with businesses, um, both large, small, medium, who, who are trying to tell us that what you're, what you're graduating is not what we need. Here's what we need, because the world, to your point, the world is changing fast around technology. And so there's, I was looking the other day, I think over the last 20 years, there's 40 or 50 new job categories that have been created because of technological changes that we've got to flex in a way to do that. And the system is not designed to flex. It's, it's designed to uh, just produce a certain type of graduate. And then you know, as an employer like Charles, you have to figure it out. What we need to do is flip that on its head. And as, as Chancellor Lana said, spend more time with the, with the, with the employers who are going to create that pipeline for us and then come back and look ourselves in the mirror and say how do we have to adjust who we are how we how we educate in a way that's much more uh, friction free much more uh, oriented to get you know I, I said to somebody the other day we measured we measure a number of our graduates as a data point but the reality is what we really should be measuring is how many work internships are we providing how many how many work how much work experience is built into curriculum and training so there's a lot of aspects to, you, to your question, but I think it goes first and foremost in the partnering with, with, the, with the employers who are gonna be the home for those students. And then our job is to continue to create a culture where uh, that's adaptable to technology as it changes rapidly. Uh, I mean, you know, AI started in, we heard first about it, ChatGPT in November, and now it's like, you know, nobody has a conversation without AI. So I think technology is gonna continue to be what who we need to be um, and less about just thinking we're just going to produce a certain product and that's going to be that's going to have to work for everybody. Uh, and last thing I wanted to say around this whole topic too is to continue a culture as Brent alluded to this culture of the students that you know creating accessibility and affordability we've kept our tuition flat for many many years we have to create more friction free systems from eighth and ninth grade all the way working with partners like Justin and others at high schools to streamline the process to where students can get into the system, can get out of the system faster, 
and then be ready to go to work. So I'm just long wanted answer to your question, but uh, the, the technology will continue. Technology, we should be responding to technology, not waiting for it to drive us. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Technology is, is shifting a lot of industries. Charles, I'm going to switch it over to you. Charles, you moved the headquarters for Kelly Moore to North Texas in April. Uh, let me just ask this, why North Texas? Thanks, and good morning, and great to be here with you. Um, Kelly Moore Paints is a 76-year-old paint brand born and raised in San Carlos, California, which is right by San Francisco Airport. So we still have 101 stores in Northern California. But for me, the decision was incredibly straightforward. Uh, when we bought the company this time last year, we had a 400,000 square foot state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Hearst, Texas, where we produced our paint that we shipped not just in the United States, but all over the world. And to me, the corporate headquarters is the head, and the, the, uh, the, the manufacturing facility is, uh, is, is the body of our business. So the head, the head needed to be connected to the body. So uh, one of my first executive decisions was to do, in fact, that, connect the head to the body, move our headquarters down here. Uh, not shockingly to the people in this room, um, not only uh, did everyone I asked to move, move to Texas, but I had a line outside my door of people asking to move to Texas. So uh, not only is it about the affordability, um, a lot of the key themes have already been talked about, but you know, just from the ground up, ability to um, move out of the Bay Area where their commutes were anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes each way, um, where they could afford to live versus where they worked, to here, where their commute times are cut by as much as 90%. Um, the safety, uh, you know, again, uh, without knocking Northern California, I've had to have some very difficult conversations with both Mayor London Breed and, Go and Governor Newsom, one of our largest single stores, um, uh, almost burnt down to the ground because we had a homeless encampment where they were siphoning off our electric from the store and almost burnt the store down to the ground. Unfortunately, I had to do quite a bit of PR around that to get them to wake up and understand that this has to change. Um, and so we come in here was 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 for many many reasons um, reinforced with everything that uh, that I've that I've come across over the last year and we, we appreciate the warm and, and and welcome that we've received here and and uh, obviously uh, in in my case we chose Irving Las Colinas uh, the headquarters of headquarters as they like to say but uh, it was a fabulous choice for us and uh, we appreciate being here. Coined by the Dallas Business Journal, headquarters of headquarters. I just had to throw that in. Char Charles, Bill Hathcock specifically. Uh, Charles, how important was the talent pipeline? How, how much digging did you do into the workforce here and how important was it? And, and talk to me about apprenticeship. What's going to happen moving forward? Yeah, uh, gr thank you. Great, great questions. Uh, I'll try to, to, I'm a New Yorker, so I can speak quickly, I think. Um, so, so a couple things. One, of course, we already had 110 employees here with our Hearst, Texas plant. So we, we, it wasn't like we were coming in cold. We knew, we knew the area. Um, for us, the talent pipeline was, was critical. Um, as one example, our research and development uh, in our plant, you, you know, everybody says innovation and paint. Paint has a tremendous amount of innovation. Um, and so um, right now, today, there's only a few schools that, uh, that really have the development pipeline. One is uh, Cal Poly in, in San Luis Obispo. So, um, starting conversations today about how we can start to build that, that channel, that pipeline of innovation and R&D talent. The second initiative, major initiative I kicked off is what I like to call our Store of the Future campaign. So how do we drive and bring technology into our stores? Um, we've already done a tremendous amount in the first year. Next year is going to get better and better. Um, think, how do we make our stores, you know, use the Apple Store example. Um, how do we drive technology so that our stores become more efficient? We drive digital, digitalization. Um, color digitalization, if you can imagine color matching, if you want, if you have your favorite Farron Ball color, but you don't want to pay $200 a gallon for it, come on into our stores. We'll match the color for you, guaranteed on a digital basis, and make sure you only pay something more reasonable for a can of paint. So we think we can drive value, and, 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 and that's a, yet another example. And then the third thing is, and the reason why this conference really strikes home for us is, um, three of my senior leaders in our executive team started in Kelly Moore when they were in high school and worked their way up to the executive boardroom. You do not need a college degree at Kelly Moore Paints to be successful. And I think that's a, a message that you know hopefully will resonate. Certainly if you want to go to school and work during the day and go to school at night and don't come out of school with three, four $400,000 in debt, 
I certainly think that's fiscally wise to do. Everybody has to make their own decisions, but you do not have to always go to college, and college isn't for everybody, or certainly not taking four years out to go to college. Go at night, go on the weekends. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll give you the flexible schedule to allow you to do that um, and start you in, in high school with, with either uh, after school programs or, or weekend programs. I know uh, I'm three guys that agree with you very strongly, and they're sitting right here. Uh, Brent, I want to throw this at you. you. You speak very well, and you're the expert on tax and, and uh, advisory. Um, any insights? And you, you talk a lot about the transition from, from uh, specifically Northern California, we're allowed to say that, uh, to Texas. Any insights on Charles's move and Kelly Moore? Well, look, I, th I think it makes a lot of sense for all the reasons that we've been discussing. I guess, Charles, one question I have for you is, did you get an enterprise zone when you moved? And if you didn't, I've got a card for you at the end of this session. Um, but, you know, in Texas, we do have a, a very uh, you know, effective uh, economic development uh, plan. Um, unlike most states, ours is not just top down. Uh, it's a collaborative effort between local jurisdictions, uh, the state, and we work together to create packages that will help defray the cost of relocating and moving, which are not not inconsequential, especially if you're moving a manufacturing facility or a plant like that. Uh, and what it does is it allows you to defray part of those costs. You know, it's not necessarily going to be the biggest incentive package you would get, uh, but it's very effective and it's a very effective use uh, of, uh, you know, state, uh, local, and federal taxes. So, you know, we represent a lot of companies that come here. Um, many of them come here because of all the reasons we've discussed, but you know, having the ability to defray some of those costs is important and uh, just adds a little bit of velocity to the process. So we're, we're coming up on time here. Thank you, Brent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask each of you to respond to this. It's sort of a softball, but it's also a very broad-based question. Uh, so, so we'll pass this down the line here. Uh, in terms of economic growth, what does the future hold for North Texas? I think the future is incredibly bright, Ollie. Uh, you know, we read in the Wall Street Journal about the slow down, the soft landing, whether there might be a recession. If you're in Texas, you probably don't care as much, honestly, because, uh, you know, the economy is so strong here uh, that we think even, you know, even if, uh, you know, much of the world slows down, uh, we're, we're not going to see that here, uh, in, in my view. Yeah, well, I'm a, that softball's about this big. Uh, you know, it's just, it's all been said. I think there's so many advantages to being here. Uh, I think for bringing families here like Charles has done and for, for talking to international partners and others, the safety is a huge one. Uh, and the ability to maintain that safety is where I would focus a lot of it. The, the economy is, speaks for itself. The fact that I think we've got, we as leaders have got to, uh, you know, colleges ha have historically looked at being more and more selective and talk more about how many students they turned away versus how many students they accept. We've got to go in a different direction and be much more affordable, accessible, just because so we can keep this workforce fully educated. And so to me, that's a reason to move here, too. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. The, the way that the North Texas miracle continues is by having a skilled, trained workforce. And so we fill the weight of that responsibility. Um, but it's going to take creativity. Uh, higher ed has to think differently. Uh, colleges and universities have to uh, look at the way we do things differently. We're, we're certainly doing that at Dallas College. We need employers to think differently as well. And so uh, we need to get creative together. So the question about apprenticeships in Germany, we have the largest number of apprenticeships in healthcare than any place in the country right here at, at Dallas College. We have 30,000 high school students that are dual credit early college um, P-TECH students. And at each of those P-TECHs, we have industry partners. So we have over 100 industry partners partnering with those schools. And so, you know, I'll, I'll tell this story just very quickly. At one of our partner high schools, Adamson High School, the partners are DISD, Dallas College, and uh, American Airlines and IBM as the two industry partners. When those students graduated, American Airlines hired the first cohort of those students and hired them for $58,000 a year. So you think about the impact of that. You're 18 years old, you just graduated high school, you just got an associate's degree in cybersecurity from Dallas College, which by the way, we waive the cost of dual credit tuition, so uh, no debt. Uh, and this major employer in the area has hired you. But here's the power of those partnerships and why we have to, can get, have to continue to get creative together to build those kind of partnerships is that the average family household income 
that those students came from was $28,000 a year. So if we want to continue to change an economy, uh, build skills, uh, to have a, a, a workforce that we need to continue this, we need to partner together to be able to do those kind of things. Yeah, so um, for, for us, I mean, look, we're, we are the professional painter's paint store. So, you know, when you, when you look at who we compete against, look, obviously, Sherwin-Williams is the 800-pound gorilla. We are certainly the David in the field of Goliaths. We're the, we're the, we're the mid-major. Um, but, but what differentiates us is we service the professional paint contractors. So, as I like to say, if, if those who know use us, then hopefully uh, that, that spills over down into to, to you all making some good decisions on paint as well. But, but what that means to your question is, is we, we service 400 of the top paint contractors in the United States. And as the economy turns and as things start to, to turn, we'll see, and we already have seen, it's a leading indicator, the move away from new home starts to now res residential repaint, homeowners associations, um, professional paint uh, and, and maintenance and management services. Um, and so for, 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 from our perspective, things always need to get painted. Um, and we've already started to see some of that. So from that perspective, you know, if, if we do see a 10 to 20% pullback in, in equities, I don't think that's going to confuse many people. I think that's sort of where, where the, the overall market's saying we need to go. But here in North Texas specifically, um, the good news is that um, we're getting a lot of people from the Bay Area moving here. And so from, from a branding perspective, we're the number one paint brand in Northern California. So we don't have to spend more money on branding because they already know about Kelly Moore Paint. So there's a lot of good news in that for us. Um, but, but in all seriousness, um, you know, being here, being made in Texas, um, and, and getting that message out that we're made in Texas, uh, both here and into to southern Oklahoma and, and Oklahoma, uh, where we are, again, very, very well presenced is, is, is critically important to us. So we appreciate it, and thanks for the question. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists, you four, uh, the other three that left, or other two, Tom, thank you. Mayor Cheney's probably handshaking somewhere. Uh, thank you guys for supporting us. Thank you to Ryan for being the sponsor, Dallas Cowboys for hosting us, and thank you all for attending. We will see you next year at the uh, Y North Texas panel. Uh, next up is the Y South Texas panel and Bob Charlay and crew. Thank you guys.